देवेंद्र सुराना डॉक्टर सोम्य राजू सुशीला फ्रेंड्स ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स कलीग्स फ्रॉम द मीडिया गिव्स मी ग्रेट प्लेजर टू बी हियर टू डिस्कस अबाउट द सब्जेक्ट आई आई मस्ट अपॉलोजाइज आई वाज बिट हेल्ड बाय द ट्रैफिक फॉर बीइंग लेट बाय अ फ्यू मिनट्स straight away without much ado i will go to the subject proper america has been experiencing as uh, one of my speakers before me said triple uh, a rating for almost 90 odd years there was no downgrade during my grandfather's time my father's time even my time this happened only in the month of august the only two reasons one reason one person has gone to america for some treatment on landing the american dead got uh, You know, degraded. <laughs> Today, New York is being evacuated because of a cyclone. But we have been tolerating that person for such long. Nothing has happened here. So something is wrong with that person. The other way to interpret it is a longer interpretation. I will come to that. Now. On 6th August, I have a very funny habit of watching the TV whenever I get up in the morning. First thing I want to know is whether somebody is alive, dead, everything is okay. Whether dog has fallen into a well or well has fallen into a dog. What has happened? Breaking news. So morning I open the TV and the 6th August I open the TV. I, every channel, including Sanskar channels, were showing American dead downgraded. I was really shocked. You know why should all these people be so worried? Americans are not worried. Only F K V C C I and B are worried. So I said, okay, there is something wrong. So dead crisis. But then I realized there is some divine message to all of us. Sixth August, nineteen forty-five, America dropped the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. Sixth August, its dead gets downgraded. There is a karmic story in all this. You cannot miss it. And if you miss it. then there is something wrong with you not with uh, the divinity now the reactions were predictable the chinese like a stern school master told the americans to him and behave properly you are spending too much you are spending too much on military you are spending too much on your social caste cut down your caste and behave properly just like my grandmother would have told me The Japanese and the Europeans are too aged. They said, "Oh, if this has happened, you know, it should not have happened, but it has happened. But uh, you know, ठीक है." Some sort of. The Americans were like our cricket uh, captain Dhoni. After being thrashed 4-0, he still says we are number one. <laughs> so Obama also says we are still number one. Whether rating, no rating, we are not bothered. The Indian reaction was very funny. Pranab Mukherjee was to address uh, CIA on the morning of sixth. So people told him, "Sir, what is this uh, downgrading has happened? What are your reactions?" He said, "Yes, Americans downgrading is a very big thing, you know, but uh, we are not worried. But we are in a crisis. <laughs> we are in a crisis. Indian economy is uh, fundamentals are strong, but." Uh, Indian economy is properly insulated also. <clears throat> Till the other day, they will say we have to globalize much more globalization. We have to integrate with the world. Suddenly, once there is a crisis, they will say we have got sufficient Louis Gates, we have got escape chutes, we all sorts of jargon will come in. By the way, I will go on reminding you people that uh, the Prime Minister is an economist, so that uh, all of us are forgetting that fact. Uh, so, first, uh, uh, Prime Minister is an economist. Now you have to understand that globalization has hurt America more than all of us. Globalization is actually leading to halal of, in, of the U.S. economy. It is bleeding, and it will die. American economy is very peculiar economy, and I will give the reasons for that. that globalization has actually impacted and we have all actually benefited out of globalization that is a new theory that is coming out to 
understand that, you have to understand how the global economy has been functioning. And to that, I will have to tell you what is the fundamentals of economics. Economics is not a very, very complex subject like mathematics or anything else. It is a very simple subject made complicated by economists. You shoot down all economists, economics will function perfectly well. Just like if you shoot chartered accountants, your tax problems will be solved. <laughs> Now, what is this economics? It is a simple thing. You produce, you consume. If you, if there is no production, there is no consumption. Then you are in a sami or mud. So, production only, if it is there, then there is consumption. But if you consume everything, then there is no surplus. If there is no surplus, there is no saving. If there is no saving, there is no investment. If there is no investment, there is no production. This is a simple calculation. If one of these goes up or down, you have to create an external incentive to ensure that the whole economic theory is balanced. If people produce more, you have to put some taxes and curb their production. If people consume less, you have to give some tax incentive so that they consume more or some fiscal incentive, tax incentive or something. If there is no saving in the economy, you have to import saving or foreign direct investment, then you call foreign direct policy. All these are economic policy, but look at it. What is true for the household is true for the economy. Up till 1980, this went on. Suddenly, economics was turned upside down. All economic theories were turned upside down. And they said supply side economics. Supply will create its own demand. The more consumption driven economics must be there. People must be consuming. People must consume. And the more consumption happens, everything will be lost. That is, if you go to a doctor with a stomach ache, he says consume. You go with a headache, he says consume. Likewise, economics was turned into a simple jargon of supply chain economics. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher started this along with a great economist called Hayak, who received the Nobel in 1974 or 73. Nobel was a contemporary to Keynes. And Keynes propagated that government intervention must be there. And he wrote a theory that was suitable for wartime economics, wartime recu recuperating economics. That turned into what is called as economics that ran through till 1970s. But after 1970s, the initial thrust provided at Keynes was no more there. So whatever Hayat told in 1945 became the correct economics in 1970. See, once upon a time, this bell bottom was there. It went up. Suddenly, it is coming back. Economic theory is also like that. You keep it closed for 30 years, suddenly you pick it, it will again go oh, oh, What a fantastic theory. Immediately, one fellow will get longer. Okay. By the way, Prime Minister is an economist. Now, Coming to this very fundamental issue, America started consuming. And this consumption was not only economic driven, there was something more sinister to it, which I think an enlightened audience like this I can share with you. That this coincided with the destruction of American family values. When you destroy family, it was done by liberating women from men and men from women and both from families. Women's liberation is not liberating women from men, it is also liberating men from women. You have to understand that. And what did we do? We did a very, very peculiar thing in this. In the whole movement, families got destroyed, children got orphaned. Single parent children became the norm in America. And for all the social responsibility which is taken by mother, father, grandfather, uncle, auntie, everybody, government was there to provide social security. And when the family got destroyed, consumption went up. And when government could not handle social responsibility, they privatized the government. And when privatized corporates could not handle the responsibility and had to de-risk themselves, they became large corporates and they became multinational corporates and they entered various countries. This is how globalization was first 
on the world. Because American corporates had to de-risk themselves from whatever they were operating in America because they knew that it was, uns it was completely unsustainable. And if you look at the last 30 years of savings of American, the American sa uh, household saving has been shifted from the hands of American uh, households into the hands of American corporates. When you reduce interest rates, what do you do? You, put, you don't put the money in the banks, you put it in the stock market. Or you go and buy goods. Because it doesn't make sense for you to save. By lowering interest rates, you actually incentivize people to spend. You don't, you, you have turned economics on its head. This is, these are the theories today we are seeing. The more lower rates of interest prevails, people will spend. And spending is good. And this was the, adver uh, this was the advice given by uh, Jagdish Bhagwati and T. N. Srinivasan, Dr. T. N. Srinivasan, to government of India in the early 90s, that Indians are saving wastefully. They must spend. And unless they spend, Indian economy will not grow. They are wastefully saving. At that time, our savings rate was 18-19%. Indian housewife said to Dr. Manmohan Singh, thank you very much. We are a good economist. Now our savings rate is 38%. We went to the shops, uh, ladies will actually go to the shops, they will do wonderful window shopping and come back. They will not buy much. Today we have increased our savings. Contrary to the popular belief that interest rates will bring down, uh, or rather will increase consumption, uh, will bring down savings and increase consumption, actually it has done the reverse. It has increased savings and kept the consumption steady. This is the beauty of it. Now, as uh, I think Dr. Uh, Chaudhary said, in America another thing happened. He talked about weapons of mass destruction derivatives. I will just explain to you how it works. I have a car. I go and insure my car. First of all, my car is stolen or it meets with an accident, I get 3, 4, 5 lakhs, whatever I insure. Now, if this, Mr. Chowdhury goes and insures my car with an insurance agent and says if Venkatesh's car meets with an accident, you pay me this much. If it doesn't meet with an accident, I will pay you this much. Not only he, 50 more people go and insure the car. Then, it is better for all of us to actually break the car, take the money from the insurance company. This is what is derivatives. This is what has happened in America. That People have speculated and taken positions on what would be the loss or credit flows or uh, currency movements of somebody else's position, and there is no burn. And that is why somebody like Warren Buffet said, derivatives are weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Next thing. But how did we all come to depend the Euro on the US dollar this much? For that, we have to go back to the World War. Two. During the World War, all of us gave gold to America and got iron and steel in form of guns and other things. So Americans got gold and they gave guns. So after the war, the gold reserves in America was the highest. And Lord Maynard Keen suggested that $35 per troy ounce must be the rate of gold and dollar must be backed by gold. And all of us must fix our foreign exchange vis-a-vis -vis US dollar, thereby our currencies are also indirectly linked to the gold standard. Slowly, America, like a milkman who mix uh, water with milk, they started producing more dollars than the gold that they had in the fourth month. The French were the first to discover, and they said, take the dollars, give me the gold. That's fully convertible for gold. The Americans did it for some time. Again, a very important day, 15th August, 1971. President Nixon said, from now on, I cannot give you gold. But by that time, world is used to dollar. And what should have been settled by the father's generation is still unsettled. We don't know what is the backing of the dollar. But we all believe, collectively believe, the dollar has been backed by something. 
and we all said we will not question it. So we all continued to trade and having a collective belief in the dollar. Americans then said, instead of dollars, let us now introduce crude oil. Yes, it is gold. So crude oil became a substitute for gold. So prices of crude were raised all across the world. That is why the oil shocks in the early 70s. And oil purchase, which happened in around 180, 190 countries, came into the hands of 10 countries which are the OPEC countries. 10 world countries which are the oil producing and exporting. And Americans told these countries that you don't sell oil in any currency other than in dollar. And you sell it only in New York and in London. And that too only in dollar. So an Iranian, if he wants to sell oil to an Indian, we have to pay only in dollar. So we require to always keep a dollar reserve, which means we always had a demand for dollar. We always used to need a dollar because we needed, some, some country may have to purchase oil, some country may have to purchase rice, some country may have to purchase something else. But oil, most of the countries used to need. So oil was in, invariably becoming the de facto standard for dollar. Then WTO came, every trade started getting denominated in dollar. From single commodity, it became multi-commodity multi factor. So dollar became backed by almost every other currency. Then Asian crisis came. When Asian crisis came, this is the tipping point. When Asian crisis came, currency is depreciated by 30% in Asia. Countries from Japan to Indonesia, almost 10, 12, 14 countries, saw their currencies depreciate overnight by 10%, 12%, and at the end of the crisis by 30%. Every country realized that there was a virtue of a weak currency. Even a weak currency has a virtue. It, they said, okay, we will now import, uh, enter the export market. And they all started exporting. And by that time, America had lost its hand on manufacturing. Completely it has lost its hand on manufacturing. In fact, there is a wonderful cartoon which says, Americans have landed on the moon. Somebody is looking from here in binoculars. From 1x, they make it to 10x. They are able to see the American flag. From 10x, they make it to 100x. I say, below the flag it is written, made in China. <laughs> so all the goods that were manufactured in this part of the world got into the American hands. America was consuming, by that time, consuming more than it was, was producing. So East Asian production was a boom to America, and it came at a cheap rate, cheap cost, and it was actually export of depression from East Asian countries to America, which helped inflation being controlled in America. Because more goods came at a cheap rate. America said we will not do manufacturing. Manufacturing will be done by Chinese, Filipinos, Malaysians, Indians. We will only do derivative trading. We will do only, you know, stock market analysis, insurance, medical. Whatever we have to outsource, we will outsource to Indians and Chinese and others. They will take care. Why are we sure? Be happy. But look at the consequences. The whole goods got produced here and we gave it to the Americans. What did the Americans give us? They gave us dollars. We kept the dollars in the puja room. We gave it to State Bank of India or Bank of Corona. They in turn gave it to Reserve Bank. What does the Reserve Bank do with the dollars? They in turn gave it to Americans and took the IOU. The treasury note which the American gives you is the IOU. They have taken the money. They have taken our goods, they have taken our money. And we are happy. India has got 300 billion. What do you think about it, finance minister? I think we are in a very comfortable exchange position. You have taken your underwear and your money. And you are happy about it. World over, this is called globalization. The theories are produced. Are they have taken my money and the goods you don't. What are you are going to get from America? Tissue paper. But, but no economist is questioning this. What is America going to give you? Today, China has got $3 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserves sufficient to give each Indian one nano free. That is the amount of money he is having. India is having $300 million. Japan is having 1.1. Korea, 
almost 400. Taiwan, another 400 billion. Hong Kong, another 400 billion. I could be wrong by 50, 60 billion dollars here and there. All these fellows, where have they went? America. And the best thing is, if I borrow money from this gentleman, I am supposed to be poor, he is supposed to be rich. In macroeconomics, it is entirely the reverse. The borrower is called a rich country, the giver is called a poor, developing Asia, Asia economy. Right? Can you ever believe that these type of thing that goes on in... Uh, and you question this, people say, what is this, sir? You don't understand. I am under, without understanding, only I am questioning. <laughs> now, what has happened? That is why Chinese are alarmed. Chinese have actually lent money to Americans. Americans are not discussing. That is why Americans are happy. They are discussing whether to bomb Pakistan or Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan. As, as what is it? As pact policy. Whether to interfere in this country or whether to withdraw from that country. That is the discussion there. You mean to say in uh, America, in any place, will they be discussing about the dollar? They are not bothered about the dollar. They have outsourced the defense of the dollar to every other country. If dollar works, RBI has to answer. If RBI, dollar works, China has to worry. If Americans don't have to worry. I'll give you a very good example. In 2008, at the height of Lehman Brothers crisis, Lehman has collapsed, Bear Sands collapsed, AIG collapsed, Merrill Lynch collapsed. Everybody, daily one tarpanam is happening in New York. Then I found this, there was a debate between this Sarah Palin and Joe Biden, this uh, vice presidential candidate. The, uh, three presidential candidates and one vice presidential candidate debate. Morning, 4 o'clock, I landed up from somewhere, I opened the TV, I saw these two people. Aha! Let me listen. So let me listen what they are going to say about the dollar. Not a word about the dollar. Sarah Palin says, first Iran, then Afghanistan, then Pakistan. This is my sequence of Bombay. Joe Biden says, no, 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 no. First Pakistan, then Afghanistan, then only Iran. Whether it is Sarigama Padani sir, or Sani Rama Magani sir. And serious country. And, and vice presidential. I will tell you our parliamentarians are thousand times better. Thousand times better. And you must see, there must, there is a, I, I will suggest this chamber. There is a movie called Insider's Job. It received, received the Oscar for 2010 documentary movie. It's a one and a half hour movie. You must screen it and make everybody who passes through Lakhidi Kapoor come and sit and watch that movie. Because it shows how America has been watched from within. It is an insider's job. The name of the movie is so spectacular right? and it starts with something spectacular. It says, Greenland, uh, Iceland, which is a GDP of 12 billion dollars, had three banks which entered into this derivative trading and other things and ended with a loss of 100 billion dollars. The country's GDP is 12 billion, the loss of three banks is 100 billion. These banks were actually certified as most stable and spectacularly performing by an economist for whom they paid 124,000 dollars in Harvard or one of those econ uh, places. More importantly, Standard & Poor had rated these branch banks as extraordinarily performing. KPMG had a certified the accounts as one of the best. <laughs> Within days, it fell down and had a loss of $100 billion. You cannot question Standard & Poor, you cannot question KPMG, you cannot question anybody, any of these economists, inside a job. How, how somebody who is the CEO of Goldman Sachs becomes a Treasury Secretary? From Treasury Secretary, he moves on to the Fed. From Fed, he moves on to various other places. Completely, they have ripped apart. That is why after, re, after seeing that uh, CD, I say, globally, economists, globally there is no crisis of economics. Actually, economists are in crisis. Economists are in crisis. Paul Krugman says so. And he says that all the developments of the last 30 years, if I have to tabulate and say, he says, is a spectacularly useless at best and positively harmful at worst. This is the development of economics of the last 30 years. When Harvard economist says, I have wasted 30 years of my precious life visiting universities of America and Britain, understanding it. All that, all that we have to do and look at it is the emperor is without clothes. There is, there is no subject of, or, or the discipline of economics all about indiscipline. 
the most indisciplined person will be termed as the most modern economist. That is how they have changed the economics. <laughs> now, when I told you about the dollar dependence and how dollar dependence grew, I must also tell you one important thing. He understood that you are trading in oil and because of the oil denominated in dollars, everybody is having a dollar reserve and because of the dollar reserve, dollar is having a value. What if I give my oil not denominated in dollars? He said, if you are going to trade it in New York Stock Exchange and in uh, London Stock Exchange, I will create like Vishwamitra as a separate Prashant Surga and I will also create one oil exchange and it will be in Iraq. You can buy, you can buy, anybody can buy. You can give me onion, potato, yen, yuan, rupee, anything, but no dollar. <laughs> Weapons of mass destruction. Immediately army was sent. Army was sent and finally on a Vaikunde Kadesi day he was hanged and he went to Swarga. <laughs> And when uh, Mahavishnu opened the Mahadwara of uh, Swarga, he said, Salam Alaikum, and he entered first. <laughs> so this is what America has been able to achieve. A Protestant country invaded a, a Muslim country and hanged its leader on a Vaikundi Ekadis day and sent him to heaven. This is globalization. <laughs> so you must understand how geopolitics is working in tandem with our geoeconomics. It is not an ordinary subject that we are dealing with. It has got extraordinary ramifications. If, if Goldman Sachs says oil at $200 by September 2012, that means something sinister is happening. Hindu will carry it out to the front, front page. Goldman Sachs says oil at $200. We all believe because Goldman Sachs says, we believe Hindu says, but we don't know who are the people who are behind these rascals who are putting these headlines. That is the truth of the matter. Do you know, I did an enormous study on this oil in 2007 and 2008. I wrote enormous number of articles. I said this is speculation and nothing more. People said, no, China is consuming, India is consuming. Yes, India is consuming. We, we are not denying that there is consumption in India or China. But the global consumption of oil was 85 million barrels every day. Nothing more, nothing less. Actually, American strategic reserves have doubled from 350 million barrels, 350 billion barrels to 700 billion barrels in that period. They actually started stocking oil more and knowing the fact that American uh, government is stocking more, American speculators started speculating on oil. And this speculation was done by four major oil speculators, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, City Group and Goldman Sachs. And these rascals come and put it in the paper and say, oil at 200. It is like I buy, buying some land along the metro stay route and then allowing the metro route to develop. This is our model. There they have a different model. They buy oil and then say the oil will go up. Here we will buy land first and allow the metro to go through that land. <laughs> now what has happened in all these things? that American consumption has become so much of a drive. The Chinese manufacturing is so much dependent on the American consumption. Economists are now saying that they are like two drunkards. You know, two drunkards, arms in arm, they gyrate and go. They will walk till, you know, they will swing, they will go up here, up here, till eternity. But if one falls, other falls. The problem today is that if China, America falls, China will fall. If China falls, America will fall. It's a very serious problem for the world. We don't know what is to be done. And, and if dollar collapses, for every rupee of appreciation in, against the dollar, RBI will lose 300 billion rupees. So RBI has to see that rupee does not appreciate because it will take a hit on its balance sheet. So RBI daily has to defend the dollar. Americans need not bother about the dollar. It is like many of my clients who come and tell me, sir, 5,000 rupees, 8,000 rupees. I say, don't buy like this. Take 20,000 crores from the bank. The bank will take care of you. If you borrow 20,000 rupees and 30,000 rupees, they will come and daily say, NPA, I will not allow this check, that check. 
if you take 20,000 crores, the bank will daily come, sir, I went to Tirupati. I got a laddu for you, sir. I prayed for your health, sir. He will pray. He will get you Tirupati, sir. If your company is in a problem, the bank manager will talk to the prime minister and say that the policies of the government are wrong. And they will change the policies. You don't have to worry. You can play golf in Singapore. The most expensive place, place to play golf. You don't have to worry about anything. So the moral of the story is, make any, any, any mistake has to be made into a big one. If you make small mistakes, you'll be caught. Make a big mistake, nobody will catch you. This is the moral of the story. And, and at any time, or any time if somebody catches you, that means it's a policy decision. You can always bring in so many people. Bank will never allow a big fellow to collapse. They will pump money, they will pump money, they will pump money because they have no other uh, option. They have caught the tiger with the tail. As long as, as long as Pakistan was giving us pinpricks, it was as if a border problem between two errant neighbors unable to determine the parapet was. But once the problem became 9-11 problem, it became global terrorism. Understand, whenever there is America, it is global. This is American trade crisis, Legends for the world. <laughs> Actually, America must take lessons from the world. Uh, how to recoup itself. And I will I will now go into the lessons of the world. Lessons for the, for America from the world. Do you have another 15 minutes? Sure. 10, 15 minutes? 15 minutes, thank you. A very serious one, so I, I thought I will explain this also. Chapter 6 of the Gita is a very, very interesting definition of a karma yogi. Arjuna says, Okay, tell me what is a karma yogi. There is so much of explanation, much of which has not gone into my head, it has gone above me or below me. But there is one, one thing that Lord says that a karma yogi usually is a balanced person. She does not eat too much. He does not start, or he does not eat too much, or he does not start. He does not remain awake, or he does not sleep too much. That's how the Lord says about a karma yogi. In economics, an economy should not consume too much, should not save too much, should not produce too much, should not invest too much. And no amount of economic intervention by economists through fiscal policy, monetary policy, Tax policy, GST, VAT, Tiripuri, Puna, nothing will help you. There is something more than that. That is a missing link that the economists are trying to find out, but unable to figure that is culture. It is the interplay of culture with economics that makes the economics, economics a balanced one. In America, for instance, if you are not repaid your credit card, you can declare yourself as an insolvent and walk away. No, no, no big problem. The state gives you all protection. From then on, you will be given food coupon, everything. You can live a happy life. But for us, if you declare yourself insolvent, it is like a Hindu widow. <laughs> you cannot go and borrow. You cannot do anything. Not, not legally. Forget the legal portion. The social stigma of not repaying a debt is so heavy. That is why farmers are committing suicide. That it is not because of any, there is, there is pressure, there is other things. But the root, they are rooted to dharma. And that makes them commit suicide. So you cannot explain this simply by saying that I will provide a law for microfinance. And this institution will be there, that regulator will be there, that, that, that office will be there. Nothing. You cannot make an American consume less. You cannot make a con Chinese consume more. The Chinese are not a consumption driven economy. They are saving a driven economy. Period. They don't want to consume. You cannot say, no, 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 from today onwards you should buy four more shirts, four more pants. No. They are like that. They are born and brought up like that. Their culture is like that. You cannot make an American consume less. Today, the New York City has been evacuated. You know what does it mean? All the departmental stores are empty. They have virtually gone into all the departmental stores and taken from toothpaste to everything. 
they have taken purchase and loaded in their car and ran away. This is America. If, if there is a typhoon warning in uh, Chennai, first we won't go. If the government says, ah, we know the weather man, if he says here, it will go only to Hongol or Nellur, we don't. Eh? And invariably, it will go to that time, Machili Patnam or some other place, we'll be happily watching some TV. First thing. Second thing, if the government says vacate, also we will not vacate. Oh, hai, hai. We are so embedded, embedded, embedded to karma theory, we will say, if this roof falls, suddenly we will start philosophy. What if I go and meet with an accident outside? I will not go. Yeah, home is the safest place in our sight, right? Suddenly you will rationalize all these things and stay back here. But Americans have started running. This is their psyche. The high, slightest hint of danger, they, they, are, they collapse. Slightest hint of danger or the greatest hint of danger, we will, we will work it worse. In a crisis, we always work better. In fact, we are the best suited economy when there is a crisis. In fact, more and more crisis comes and very sure, sir, we will go into a stronger economy. Because we will think, last time we had one in 1991, immediately Manmohan Singh brought the liberalization thing. We are in a very good uh, position. Then today we are in a crisis because of corruption. Another movement will take us forward. So crisis will spur, spur us. Crisis will not put us back. So coming to Chinese, there is an IMF document in 2006. There was an ADB meet in uh, Hyderabad. And I distinctly remember Dr. Manmohan Singh making a wonderful uh, observation. He says, for the world to rebalance, America must have less of debt, and all the debts must be repaid to the original lenders. Which means America must produce more, consume less. The world must consume more and produce less. For all these things to happen, it is impossible. You can write papers, but you cannot happen in reality. It cannot happen in reality. The Chinese will consume more or the Americans will consume less. But now I'll finish with what happens to India. When you compare with America, <coughs> India is a savings economy. We save 40% of our GDP. America's savings is almost negative and brought to zero because of Indians and Chinese over there. If we are not there, it will be much higher, American savings. Of this 40% or 36, 37%, that is the rough figures that the government of India tells us, almost 36, 37% is invested in India. 36% is of the GDP is saved, 36, 37% is invested in India. Difference is perhaps 1%, which is the foreign direct investment which comes in. In other words, 1% of the GDP is a FDI. And of this FDI, it is not actually foreign direct investment, it is foreign indirect investment in this country. Actually our own money which goes out, gets whitewashed through the Havala route and comes back to the Mauritius route and we say foreign in investment and give the red carpet welcome to it. If it is here, it is called black money. If it goes out and comes in, red carpet welcome. No, uh, there was a, just to break the monotony, one of my friends did CA with me. She failed here. She could not pass the CA exam. You know, our CA exam is a very tough exam. Whether it is tougher or not, the percentage is only 2%, percent, pass percent. I will, I will put it this way. Then she got married and she went to America. Her husband was in NASA and she did the CPA there. She passed it immediately. She came to India. And some of my colleagues were working in some company. She came there as a boss to... <laughs> Can you ever believe the irony of fate here? <laughs> that this lady could not pass CA here has become the boss of those very people who passed with rank. We have got an extraordinary ability to decry ourselves, depreciate ourselves. I think no other country can do this. Now, when it comes to India on consumption, we are 40% of 40% is saving, that much amount is our investment. By and large, our imports and exports are balanced. Except that the imports are more than the exports by around 100 and 120 billion dollars, which is primarily 80 billion dollars of crude, 30, 30, 40 billion dollars of gold. Otherwise, imports and exports are tally. 
On top of it, we get money from our NRA brothers who send around $60 billion from abroad. Another $60, $80 billion comes in through various remittances year on year. This, this takes care of our foreign exchange. But don't get fooled by these billions and trillions. Huh? So all 1%. Actual saving is done by your mother, your sister, the lady at the house. They save and they are running the Indian economy and they are insulating from global crisis. <laughs> Till the lady on the house is working and she controls your economy, even Dr. Manmohan Singh cannot ruin Indian economy. <laughs> I can be very clear about that. They, they may try, but they cannot ruin. But the real fact is our economy is running on being the insulation part is unfortunately attributed to foreign direct investment, which is, as I told you, has no meaning and no relevance in India. Foreign direct investment, if it comes, good. If it doesn't come, no problem. We will continue. And if you raise your interest rate by 2%, that will be taken care of. Goldman Sachs paper number 187 has talked about India's future and our infrastructure uh, needs and finance, means of, uh, modes of financing. It says India requires 1.7 trillion dollars in the next 10 years to put its infrastructure in order. And it says not a naya paisa will come from outside. 1.7 trillion dollars will be the money that will be produced in this country in the next 10 years to finance infrastructure alone. We are going to do something else also. But even on infrastructure, nothing. This money is nothing for us. By 2018, I'm not talking 2025, invariably Indian government is of 2050, 2017. I'm just talking five years down the line. Five years down the line, Indian economy will be roughly four trillion dollar economy. 40% saving is 1.6, 1.7 trillion dollar savings. Of that 40% will be saved in the banks, roughly 800 billion dollars will be the savings in banks, deposits. That is 32, 35 lakh crores. Year on year will be the money that will pour into banks. You know what is the aggregate deposits of last 65 years into banks? It is 35 lakh crores. So what we have done in the last 60 years, we are going to get money every year from 2018. That is going to be the, we have now reached the threshold where we are going to take off. Chinese have also got a five-year plan. They are also running their 12 to five-year plan. We are also getting into our 12th five year plan. The first draft is coming. I always comment that the first draft of the 12th plan is the 12th draft of the first plan. And nothing will change. Okay. But, but when it comes to Chinese, they have done a huge work this time. They said three things. And the most important thing is, we are going to concentrate on domestic consumption. But look at it. This month we have Vinayaka Chattusi next week. Next week we have Ramadan. Last week we had Krishna, uh, Krishna Jayanti. Before that we had some, some other function. Then we will have Navaratri, then Diwali, then Christmas, then Pongal. Everything will be a trigger for expenditure, domestic expenditure. You go to a temple, that fellow outside will say, Sir, please take at least one hand measure of flour. Go with one mango. Go with one lemon. As if Anmanji is asking a lemon. You are only triggering economics. You may not, if you are an economist, you must believe in God. <laughs> because God runs economics in this country, not finance ministry. Because the type of expenditure, can you can you say that I will not buy uh, crackers for your children in Diwali time? People say, what type of uh, miser is this? <laughs> you have to spend. You have to spend that is why we are a spending economy as far as compared to China. We are a savings economy when compared to America. We are a spending economy when compared to China. That is why our balance is still there. Our domestic consumption drives our economy even today. 56% of our GDP is domestic consumption. That is driving our economy. That is driving our economy even today. That is making us unlike the Chinese. Chinese, where is the... Uh, Hanuman Jayanti or Krishna Jayanti or Navratri. Only one festival a year. That is Chinese New Year. All the gods they drove out. Now they are saying that we will invent God and bring him in. Where is the, today if you 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 will be surprised. 
that the, every time you look at the Hindu calendar, there is some festival. And, and uh, when, whenever we celebrate it, marriage is a big celebration. That is a very big celebration. 13 days in some community, 7 days in some community. All mega serious, no short story. <laughs> Everything is mega serious. You want to, you want to die, you have to spend and only die. You cannot die so easily. So you like to kick that economy and go and go it. So everything has been done in such a way that, and believe me, all these are not in our textbooks. Ask any economist, he will say, this is what Venkatesh is speaking, it's not economics. But when you buy one hand full of, uh, hand measure of flowers, is it not economics? When you pay the prohib for the death of somebody, is it not economics? When you buy crackers for your uh, children in uh, Diwali, is it not economic? It is economics. It is ensuring that India will never have depression. Family values is what makes them extremely religious. India is not, please put that cell phone on a Manmohan Singh mode. <laughs> Now, the Indian economy is saved because of the lady in the house, your mother, your wife, your daughter. It is not because of anything. Unless we integrate culture, we need not worry about it. The lesson for the world is that please follow Indian model of economy. Balance your economy. Balance it to spending. Balance it. I am not spending. We, all of us cannot be Sankaracharya. If we are Sankaracharya, the world, world will, economy will come down in 30, days, 30 years. Period. I am not saying that you should be in the economics of China. That is also impossible. If you start depending on outsiders, either for consumption or for saving, whether for investment or for protection, you are doomed. People tell me, sir, look at Singapore. I said, look at Mylapur. <laughs> compare Singapore with Mylapur. I understand that. But don't compare India with Singapore. Singapore imports water. Can we import water? Can we import water? As a country, can we import water? This water are we talking? It is a small city. You can compare Hyderabad with Singapore. You can compare Chennai with Singapore. But not India. India has to have a model. This model is something that luckily is not known to the world. That is why this has not been destroyed. We have kept it in our bedrooms and in our toilets secretly, like black money. And that is why it has survived. The lessons for the world are very clear. Follow Indian model. Follow the culture of culture and intertwine it with your economics. Make your economics feminine. You cannot have a masculine economics. The economics has a gender. And Indian economics is feminine. The lady of the house decides what you spend, what you should not spend. You can come here and say all these things. She will only decide what you should do. <laughs> you have got her permission. Okay. And unless the lady of the house controls the house, no power on earth can do anything to her. Thank you very much.